Welcome to this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade Podcast, where we look forward to shaving every day. Welcome to episode 97 of the podcast. My name is Rick DeWeese. I'll be your host this week. Well, I've made it back from Camp Alive. Um, all was good. Vacation was great. Um, I'll tell you about it during this episode. Had some great times. Um, you know, it was uh, it was camping. It was away from everything. It was away from computers. Had limited, if any, cell phone coverage, um, which is really a blessing sometimes. It's really good, you know, in today's technological age. You know, we try, at least I do, I try to, you know... Uh, detach from time to time from the from the technology from the computers from the cell phones you know sit down and take a moment sit outside in the breeze and well read a book um it's amazing how comforting that is and uh and it's really good well it, for me going up to camp um yeah it's it's a lot of that and it is just Oh, you can almost feel on a, on an hourly basis the, the worries and stresses of life just like falling off of you because, well, you've got other things to do. You know, it's just, it's just fun. So, uh, we've got a good show today. We've got uh, a letter, um, some shave of the days from camp. I'll tell you about it. Uh, Soap Commander's got a blog. Did you know that? Um, yeah, Carrie does a blog. Uh, Carrie does most of them, I believe. Uh, at least the ones that I've read, but, uh, she had one on there that, that I, I looked at here recently that, well, just really struck a nerve. So I'm going to uh, read a little bit of it and, well, expound just a little bit, um, well, because I can and because I like talking. And I haven't done this for a whole week, so I'm kind of pent up, if you will. <laughs> Uh, from uh, someone who uh, who is starting a business in the wet shaving community and uh, wanted to get the word out. And uh, so, like I've said to anybody, okay, if you are an artisan, if you have a, a blog, if you have a, uh, a podcast uh, that you're just trying to get off the ground or something like that, and it has to do with wet shaving... Uh, send me an email. Um, contact me at uh, you know brush and soap and blade at gmail dot com, and uh, let's get a spot on the uh, on the program here so that you can get the word out. I don't charge anything, and I'll play it for a couple three weeks just to uh, you know help get the word out, let people know what you're trying to do, and uh, yeah, it's good stuff. It it helps you. It helps the community, and that's what we're about here. Um, it's free. Don't charge anything. So uh, give it a consideration, and uh, if it's something that you want to do, uh, throw me an email. <laughs> All righty. So we've got somebody that did that. We'll throw his spot somewhere in the middle of the show. Um, I, I came back from work, and uh, there's a guy that I work with who uh, who I kind of uh, started into wet shaving, and uh, he had a very unique experience on a recent. Uh, on a recent vacation down in Hollywood, him and his son, or Hollywood, jeez, down in Miami on holiday. <laughs> uh, it's been a long night. Anyhow, um, he had a nice experience, and uh, he told me all about it. And, well, I get to tell you, uh, tell you about a couple more shaves of the day. Um, a Sharpologist, of course, is out there doing updates on uh, on his uh, blog and, uh, and all and uh so i i just thought i'd throw uh throw a little bit out about that as well as well some some comments about some other stuff that i saw and uh you know just well because uh and, and then finally uh, after another shave of the day i'll tell you all about well summer camp and uh what i did in summer camp and why it's special and why i enjoy it and uh yeah it's a lot of fun now i i will have to say before we get started though that uh it it's it's interesting, it is curious, and I'm still puzzling over it in my head. I was doing an electricity merit badge. Now, when you're doing electricity, you're talking sometimes about DC, and sometimes you're talking about AC. And the the boy that I was working with for this electricity merit badge, he did not understand analog. He didn't understand the concept of analog. But he did understand the concept of digital. And so we spent a good bit of time going back and forth trying to, well, bridge that gap, if you will, between 
analog and digital. And it, and it got me to thinking, you know, I, I understand his, his uh, issue, I guess, because if I was growing up in today's society, I wouldn't really understand analog either. It's just, it's conceptually not something that we deal with most of the time. Most of the time, what we deal with nowadays in today's society is, well, digital. Digital phones, digital computers, ones and zeros, CDs, digital. And so to step back a moment and uh, think about analog for a minute is both frightening, frustrating, and the terminology is a bit odd, isn't it? Which then, of course, gets me to thinking about shaving because, you know, when you start talking about single-edged and double-edged and straight razors and all of a sudden you're really kind of talking about, yeah, to a certain extent, the same concept between analog and digital. You know, the new fancy five-bladed cartridge razors that, you know, are easy to use because that's what you see all the time and that's what you experience and blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's curious the, the connections that I make and the things that I see. But I did want to describe that because that's something that I didn't talk about at the uh, at the end of the uh, of of the uh, episode there for a concerning summer camp, um, and, and it's just kind of curious, you know, because quite honestly, going into summer camp and in fact going into my adult life where I have been teaching for all kinds of stuff for a lot of years, I really never conceived or thought about the concept that analog would be something foreign. You know, for me, digital was something that I had to overcome, that I had to come to a to come to grips with, to come to an understanding of, not the other way around. So, uh, for me, it's kind of a, a a step off of a different cliff, maybe like figure it out one of these days because well, that's what I do and, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about training and teaching and, and learning new things, isn't it? And uh, so that's what we try to do, both for myself and for my scouts. Anyhow, with that for an introduction, um, let's get on with this show. I got an email from Chris. It's titled Menthol. Much like yourself, I've been averse to mentholated soaps for a while. Last winter, my mother came across a buy three, get three deal at Bath and Body Works, and she purchased six tubes of Paraso Green shaving cream. I used it a few times, it lathered well, and the shave was great, except for the menthol. A few weeks ago, I decided to revisit that cream. It was one of the first hot days of summer. I was pleasantly surprised by the feel when I went outside. I have since tried several of the Sterling Glacial soaps, and they are very nice. This morning I tried something that I would like to pass along. Fine Accoutrements has an aftershave called Snake Bite, which is only alcohol, menthol, and water. You get a little sting and a lot of cold. After my shave this morning, I applied that. Then after that dried, I followed with Clubman. I got the cold I was looking for and the scent I wanted. Thought you might want to give that a shot, Chris. Well, Chris... Thanks for the uh, for the tip. That's uh, that is a good idea. Um, I haven't tried any snake bite, but I I may go get some just because I found that as the hot summer months uh, kind of move along, if you will, um, I'm enjoying menthol more and more. In fact, uh, even during this episode, I'll talk about a shave of the day that I used a mentholated soap and thought, well, it wasn't enough, and I've never had that thought process, that that uh, idea pop into my head that a mentholated soap was, well, not enough. So it's kind of cool. Um, but pun intended. <laughs> Anyhow, Chris, thank you very much for the letter. So while I was at camp, I had a couple of shave of the days. In fact, there was a couple of days that, well... I, I'll go ahead and admit this, that I didn't shave at all. It's, uh, you know, I was on vacation, and I just thought, well, heck with it. Anyhow, the uh, the first shave of the day, I used uh, an old EverReady uh, uh, single-edged razor and a PAL carbon steel blade, and uh, I happened to use Paraso Green. Now, Paraso Green is a slightly mentholated soap, 
and uh, lathered it up. Had a police on uh, police on brush, and had my collapsible dog bowl as my uh, as my portable uh, uh, shaving mug, my my shaving bowl there, and so that that worked well. Um, the the thing that I noticed is again uh, keeping in mind that camp was hot and humid. Um, the the menthol characteristics of Parasso Green were not very great. Now, uh, again, back when I used it at the house in air conditioning, it was like, holy cow, this is, you know, this is uh, about as much as I can stand. However, out in the field in hot and humid conditions, it was, well, less than what I wanted. So uh, that was curious. That was interesting. That was, uh, well, exactly why I brought it. I wanted to find out. I wanted to see um, if the mentholated effect, how long it would last, what it would feel like, if it felt you know, worse, less, whatever, um, in those kind of conditions. So, you know, in, in that condition um, out there, hot and humid and everything else, the Parasso Green was, you know, marginal at best when it came to menthol feel. However, the, uh, the, the razor itself did a, did a fantastic job. I, I sat there on the, on the porch of the Adirondack to, while we were having some, uh, some beautiful, uh, Brazilian coffee and, uh, proceeded to, uh, to shave away. Didn't use a mirror. Um, just, you know, kind of back old school kind of thing where I just sat there and lathered up with my Plisson brush and a little Parasso in the, uh, in the dog bowl there, and uh, went to town, shaved, three passes, all was good, uh, no nicks, no cuts, you know, beautiful outdoor shave, uh, you know, cleaned up, and, you know, about the time that I finished up, well, I started sweating again. <laughs> ah, it was just one of those things, that's the way it was up at camp. So, uh, but that shave of the day was a very nice one. Another shave of the day that I uh, that I had while I was up at camp, um, I went ahead and used uh, the the straight razor that I brought with me, which was the little case straight razor. And uh, try as I might, and uh, this is probably for the best, um, I can't use a straight razor uh, comfortably without a mirror. Luckily, I have a little plastic mirror that fits in uh, in my kit and uh, works very very nicely. So uh, straight razor shaving it was. Now for this uh, uh, shave of the day, I went ahead and used some um, some deluxe shaving cream, um, bi- uh, Cool Daddyo, and uh, that's a little bit of bergamot, a little bit of orange, and a little bit more menthol. And uh, yeah, I-, I wanted to try that, and I had brought it specifically again to try out the mentholated soaps, um, and just to see how they how they worked. And uh, so I went ahead and lathered that up with the police on brush and uh, three passes with the uh, with the straight razor, a little bit of cleanup, beautiful shave. And uh, for me, that amount of menthol in those conditions was about well perfect. Um, it really felt nice. It uh, it was refreshing. It was uh, had a very clean feel to it, a very light feel to it. It was just. It was nice. I, I wasn't, you know, in the past I've said that mentholated soaps, you know, I spent more time getting it off my face than enjoying it. And, uh, this was not the case. And again, it was, it was uh, about 85, 86 degrees in the morning when I shaved and, and the humidity was fairly high and it really struck a, a wonderful balance. It was, uh, very, very nice. Um, the straight razor, of course, did an excellent job and, uh, you know, I'm always amazed that we got away from the straight razors, and I'm glad to see that we're coming back, and, and mainly because uh, it does do a phenomenal job of shaving. It, it really does. It's, uh, it's a very clean shave, and uh, um, I think I, it's, I'm able to say that it is probably easier, at least on my cheeks anyhow, to get a BBS shave with a straight than it is for anything else. So, uh, great shave and, uh, great experience. Uh, don't know if any of the kids were watching. I don't really care. It's just, you know, one of those things. 
I do what I do when I do it, and uh, if somebody cares to uh, to notice, tag along, uh, you know, whatever, talk about it. I'm game, but uh, there you go. Another great shave out in the wild blues of uh, the, uh, the, the hills of South Carolina. So one of the nice things about going on vacation is you you get to come back with well I don't know kind of a a new spirit and uh, one of the things that uh, that is nice is that you know I get to come back and and kind of look around and say okay what's been going on in the shave world while I've been gone well one of the things that's going on is Soap Commander um, and I don't know if you know this but but Soap Commander has a blog. And um, he does a real good job. I, I, it's Carrie that does the blog, but uh, the, it's on the Soap Commander site. Now I'll put a link up to the blog. But uh, the article that is that is here is, um, it's it's all about artisans and ten reasons to buy artisan products. And I thought this was really well stated. It it just it, it kind of hits home, um, uh, especially coming from well Soap Commander. Um, so, 10 reasons to buy artisan products. Number one, connection. Purchasing an item from the same person or family member who made it can create a unique bond between the buyer and the seller that goes beyond a financial exchange. In the era when relationships are harder to come by, this is a huge plus on both sides of the table. Now, when you read that, or at least when I read that, I think to myself, yes, from my side, it is great to be able to buy from an artisan directly. Um, I've bought a lot of stuff from what you would consider artisans. My hammock, for example, was made by, by the guy who makes them in his garage. My camping tarp is the same way. Um, there's a lot of camping equipment that, especially in the hammocking world, and that's one of the reasons that I enjoy it, Besides the fact that it's really, really comfortable, um, but it's it's not you know these are not high volume companies. They are small craftsmen that are are doing an absolutely outstanding job, and you know it's it it's the same as 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 that. You, you are getting better quality, at least in my opinion, for the price than you could possibly get if you bought something that was made well in mass. Okay, number two, investment, professional investment. Your money is an investment in the artisan's professional life and a vehicle by which they can continue to hone and perfect their craft. Absolutely, because the last thing that you want to do is an artisan that's really good, you know, you, you don't want them to go away because they just don't have the funds to continue. That's, well, that's the, the, the loss of, of artisan and that is not good. Um, we need more artisans. We truly do. We need craftspeople. We need we need people that have a, a passion and an understanding and the ability to do things that well, average people just can't. You know, whether that be making a soap, making a hammock, you know, whatever, making a pen, a brush. Um, we need people that can do that. Okay. Number three, investment. Personal. Your money is also an investment in the artisan's personal life, allowing them to make an honest living for themselves and, many times, support a family, which is absolutely correct. I mean, you know, nobody gets in business just to, well, donate their time and efforts for nothing. You know, at the end of the day, people have to do things that will allow them to support their families. And if if they do something that we as a public, we as a population, a society, enjoy and and can can benefit from, it is in our best interest to make it profitable enough for those folks to be able to uh, continue to do what they do, both on a professional and on a personal level. Number four, quality. Many artisan products are not cheap to purchase, and neither are they cheap to make. The investment of high-quality materials coupled with good, old-fashioned time and attention lay the foundation for a product of excellence. But I couldn't have said that better. Um, the 
the quality of material is probably superior. I'm not going to say in all cases, but it's probably superior. It is uh, sourced with passion, with conviction, with understanding, with that craftsmanship we were talking about. People who make things understand, especially if they're going to sell it to someone else, that, wow, it's either this or the garage door. Ugh. Luckily, we have adult beverages. Otherwise, this would drive me insane. <laughs> okay, okay, get it over with. Come on, do something. Oh, my God, now it's the answering machine. Some officious, uh, putain. <laughs> okay. So, quality. Quality. All right. Yes. Things are typically made, especially by people who are going to sell them to others. If it's for your own personal use, it's one thing. But when you sell to others, you cross mentally this line. And you have your personal brand, yourself, your own name on these things. And in a lot of cases, that really drives a desire, a passion for quality that cannot, in uh, under any circumstances, be bought uh, with a mere salary or wage in a manufacturing environment like a company. Okay, number five, details. Due to the fact that a person, not a mechanized assembly line, is creating the products either by hand or by other traditional methods, there will be variances, some intentional, some unintentional, between individual items or batches. These details are celebrated reminders of the origin of each piece of art. And, and that's also well stated because, again, a true craftsman looks at everything that they do as a work of art. It's, it's not... It's not like you're making the same widget, the, the, the same, you know, space cog, if I can use a Jetsons metaphor. Um, you know, Spacely's cogs, you know, it's just the same thing over and over and over again, and nobody cares, and it's just, okay, it's a cog. Who, you know, whatever. I just stamp them out, and I make eight and hit the gate, and I go home, and, you know, no big deal, right? That's not the way it is with artisans. Artisans look for, well, a little hint of individual, individual, their own to a certain extent, in everything that they make, in everything that they put together, in, again, everything that they put their name on. Number six, customization. Some, though not all, artisans allow for customization or personalization of their products. For example, an artisan jeweler, uh, for example, an artisan jewelry maker may be willing to use stones from your grandmother's necklace to create a set of earrings for you. A personalized piece can contain a lifetime of memories. Artisans often time for soaps, for example, make, make soaps for special occasions or seasonal soaps. I dare say Procter & Gamble or Gillette doesn't make seasonal soaps. In fact, I dare say they don't make really soaps that have any significant scent at all. Whereas the artisans in our community are very willing to do that in most instances. Customized labels, customized scents. It's really an amazing thing when you think about it. Because these are not big companies. These are, well, craftsmen, artisans. Number seven, uniqueness. Even when an artisan product is not made specifically for you, it's still an item that does not have an exact match in the world. The opportunity to have a handmade, one-of-a-kind item is pretty remarkable. For example, um, the brushes that, that we uh, sold, the, the Nathan Clark brushes, each one is similar. I dare say no two are the same, because they were, in fact, made by hand. Soaps, even though they may be the same batch 
they're not poured the same. They don't necessarily have the same level of dispersion of products within them. You would hope that they would be close, but there are going to be some differences and some nuances. The the labels, even something as simple as the labels, they, they try to be centered, but maybe there's one that's just, well, a, a bit off, and it's yours. That's kind of cool, really, because you realize that this thing was not put together by a machine. It was not assembled on a on a factory floor where really it's just a number, where it's just a piece of product going out the door so that somebody's indicator can be good and, yes, today I've made my quota. No, it was done with care and love, quite honestly. And it was put together so you could have it for you. It might have been put together by a family member of the artisan. It might be. It might have been put together by the artisan himself. It really is something special, and it is something that creates absolutely unique experiences. Number eight, economics. Buying a handcrafted item supports our nation's economy, especially since most artisans are themselves small businesses or part of one. When you are able to take that step further and buy local, it's a winning situation for not only the artisan and the community, but for you as well. Now, I would say that within the uh, nation, in fact, within the world, we are a community of wet shavers. When we buy from an artisan, when we buy an artisan's product, we are helping promote our own community. Now, in this case, we're talking about uh, buying locally. If you happen to have, for example, the huh, the uh, uh, blessing, if you will, to be down the road from Soap Commander and you have the opportunity to buy those types of products um, right there from, uh, from them locally, absolutely. You know, in a lot of cases, if you uh, if you have the opportunity, it is so much nicer to go to things like farmer's markets and and things of that nature to buy food that was grown locally. It tastes better. Plus, you get to actually meet and interact with people within your community, and that in and of itself is a plus. It is a blessing. Now, for us within the wet shaving community, we have the opportunity to commu uh, communicate on many, many different levels with artisans in this community, whether that be Facebook, Google+, Twitter, uh, whatever. Um we do. We're really a very vocal crowd, and uh, we don't mind talking to each other, which brings about a very unique spirit within the hobby. And so, again, if we can, if we can purchase something from artisans that support what we do, who who support that that customization and the ability to to do those things, well, we're just all better off, aren't we? Number nine, encouragement. Sometimes it's just good and worthwhile to buy uh, from someone just for the sake of encouraging them. Your vote of confidence via your wallet may be just the thing that spurs them on that particular day. You know, it's kind of like me for, for emails. Every now and then, quite honestly, I'll be going along and I'll think, oh gosh, does anybody care? Does anybody listen? Um, uh, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, I do look at my numbers every now and then, but, but there's just this mindset where you just... You know, it, you don't want it to become drudgery, but it, well, sometimes just because of life, does. And then you get an email, or you get somebody asking you for your product. It's about the same thing, because it is a personal touch. It is someone reaching out to you for what you do, whether that's a, a podcast, or making a soap, or a brush, or, or a razor, or whatever. It is a personal moment where somebody says, hey... Um, I've been paying attention, and uh, thank you. Here, I, I would like to order something, or I would like to ask you a question, or I would like to participate. That's a great feeling. The, the level of encouragement is astounding. And the thing is, once again, this is not something that is going to happen on the shop floor of a large company. The, they, the employees of a large company may, from time to time, understand that there are people that are emailing them and sending them compliments and things like that. But it's not often. 
An artist, on the other hand, because of their personalized experience, because of their their being right there and, and dealing with all aspects of what they're doing, um, yeah, they know about it, and they do appreciate it. Number 10, people. An artisan product is an artisan product because of people, plain and simple. The people who make them and the people who buy them. Without this mutualistic relationship, true artisans and artisans' products would be a thing of the past. If you didn't have that personal connection, nobody would do it. It wouldn't be worth it. It really wouldn't. Um, and in fact, that's kind of what makes artisans special, is because they do continue to do it, and we do have the ability to reach and touch and communicate with each other and, and talk about things and say, hey, you know, maybe uh, maybe this would be a good concept, or thanks for doing that. So anyhow, um, I will link to this post, but uh, I thought it was an absolutely great thing. It really got me thinking about a lot of different stuff, um, and I enjoy that. So if you haven't checked out the Soap Commander blog, uh, like I said, I'll link to it. It's good stuff. The final shave of the day at camp was uh, was a shower shave. I went ahead and used my uh, my single edged ever ready razor and uh, lathered up some um, some Spice Trade uh, from Wickham's soap. I brought my sample with me and uh, gave me that uh, that Old Spice feel and uh, really really nice. It was the day that we left, and uh, I figured, well, I'll go ahead and shave so that when I'm out in public in my Class A uniform and representing scouts and uh, setting the example for my scouts um, that uh, I would be clean shaven and uh, in good shape. You know, one of the things that we do when we leave scout camp is after a week of being out in the hot and humid and uh, and all that, uh, we go and and we have breakfast at Hardy's. And uh, part of the enjoyment of that breakfast at Hardy's is to uh, sit in a place to eat that is actually air conditioned because at the camp the uh, the dining hall is not <laughs> and uh it uh, it has made on a couple of occasions a rather interesting experience when you're trying to eat hot food and you're too busy sweating just from the environment to even really notice the food at all <laughs> so it is a bit of a treat but uh you know you want to want to look good out in public and uh so there you go. So a little bit of spice trade, the uh, the old ever ready brush, kind of uh, you know harkening back to the 1920s, uh, uh, you know 1920s, 1930s single edged razor, uh, you know, old spice smelling stuff, and uh, it, yeah, it was good stuff. Now one of the things that I noticed though is that my shower at home, being a little bit more of a closed environment, you know, it's a room. Um, you know, it's got okay ventilation, but it's, uh, but it's nothing like the, uh, the more open, uh, camp shower. And, uh, what I noticed is that the shower shave experience was, well, different. Um, it was not as easy, I guess, to get a, uh, a, a BBS shave, mainly because of the, uh, the humidity levels. The humidity levels in the shower at home, again, because of the more closed environment, are much higher and therefore uh, contribute to a much uh, you know easier time at getting a BBS shave. So that was one of the things that I that I wanted to find out, that I wanted to try and test. I had the hypothesis in my head, but I wanted to uh, well see if that was in fact the case. So uh, open air showers and uh, or showers that are you know much more open, if you will, would uh, would probably tend to be. Uh, uh, less uh, less luxurious and more like, well, just shaving in front of the mirror at the sink, um, I guess is the easiest way to put it. Uh, whereas for me, showering and, and, you know, at home and shaving in, in the shower that I have at home is truly a luxurious experience because of the level of steam and humidity involved. So uh, good stuff. But anyhow, I walked out of camp... Uh, Feeling, uh, at least, uh, on my face, uh, clean shaven and in good shape. Of course, by the time I walked down to the truck, uh, you know, I was completely covered in sweat like I just walked out of the shower, but hey, you know, it's, uh, it's camp. Guys, do you want to get rid of that stubble? Ow! 
Ouch, when are you going to shave? If so, your search is over. The ShaveMercantile.com is your source for quality wet shaving supplies. Now you can order your favorite soaps, blades, razors, aftershaves, and more, all from one place. The Shave Mercantile is American-owned, taking pride in providing you with quality customer service. Check out our selection today at theshavemercantile.com. Theshavemercantile.com, your source for quality wet shaving supplies. So having been gone for a couple of days from, uh, from the old workplace, uh, I had an enjoyable conversation with a colleague who is uh, also into wet shaving. He had recently gone and uh, on vacation and had been in Miami, if I uh, remember the story correctly. And it was in Miami that he received a haircut and a shave at a Cuban barbershop. And he said that the guy that did it, while a younger fellow, um, somewhere in his yeah, mid mid to late thirties, I said there was no older gentleman that was working in the shop, and uh, him and his son went in for these shaves. He said this guy spent oh easily forty five minutes on a on a haircut and then a shave. And the shave was a uh, a straight razor shave, and he said the haircut was really nice. But yeah, you know, he said if you you know on, on normal occasions you go to a barber shop and they give you a haircut and they take a razor or something and they'll you know trim around your ears and in the back and everything and make sure everything's kind of lined up and neat. He said this guy went around my whole face like that. And he said, then when he gave me the shave, he said it was really, really interesting. First off, he used lots and lots of hot towels. It's like when he wasn't being shaven, he was constantly under the hot towels. And uh, he said the other thing that was interesting is the amount of lather that he put on for shaving was not as thick as what he uh, he had originally thought it would be. It was uh, a little bit thinner. It was it was almost to the point where it was there, but you could still see skin. So uh, he said that was a, a unique experience. The other thing that he said was that at no point with the straight razor did the guy take any long strokes. He said they were all short strokes, very similar to buffing um, with a uh, with a safety razor uh, is is what I kind of uh, associated it with but he he described you know the the different passes the you know the the with the grain and then cross grain and then against the grain but always using a buffing action he did say that uh, the, the the finish was just he said he was as smooth as smooth could be as as smooth as the tabletop that we were resting on while we were speaking so that was uh, that was interesting, and uh, I, I must say I was well a tad jealous at the same time. You know, just to uh, to go down and have that kind of well luxury. He also told me the price, and that was also something that had me just a tad jealous because he only paid twenty five dollars for uh, for this, and uh, I found that to be well an exceptional uh, bargain, really. Um, very, uh, very nice price, uh, especially when you consider that the, that the, uh, guy took about 45 minutes to, uh, to do the job. True craftsmanship still exists, which is good to know. It's, uh, it's one of those things that, uh, well, make me happy to know that, that certain trades and certain craftsmanship capabilities will not pass into the night when uh, when this generation or perhaps the generation uh, ahead of me disappears. So all good stuff. And he said it, the most amazing thing was he didn't have to shave for about two days just because it was, well, that close. So good stuff. And if I'm ever in Miami, I may go look the guy up. So this morning's shave of the day, I... Uh, I wanted to do something well just a little bit different so i i grabbed my my police on brush again and i uh, grabbed my my tub of razor rock p160 
Now, in previous outings with the P160, I had noted just a, a slight, very, very mild irritation. And uh, for this go with the uh, with the Razor Rock, I I happened to grab my Mercure uh, Bakelite razor, and I don't know if it's a uh, if it was the blade, the the wear on the blade, or the P160, but irritation, uh, yeah, a um, little bit of razor burn, yeah, mild case of razor burn, but more of a chemical type uh, uh, irritation. And I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it is from the P160. Um, I did face lather, which, uh, which exposed my face and skin to the, uh, to the P160 probably more than, uh, than what I normally experience when bowl lathering. Um, however, the, uh, the irritation, um, ensued. And in fact, it was, uh, Quite fun when I threw on some uh, some Phoenix uh, aftershave that happened to have a lume in it. Uh, between the lume and the alcohol, it was like uh, well, it was a wake up call, if you will. So uh, that was interesting. Um, good shave of the day, however, and uh, you know, trying to uh, to get things sorted out and uh, get ready for the day. It is, after all, a Monday, and uh, part of me is looking forward to it, and, well, part of me isn't. But uh, there you go. That's kind of what it's like sometimes. Uh, sometimes you have no choice but to uh, go out and battle the dragon, and hopefully uh, you win, but, uh, well, sometimes you don't. So we'll see. We're in good shape. We're, uh, you know, the equivalent of armored up, and uh, there you go. So uh, all in all, good shave of the day. Great way to start a Monday after vacation. Sharpologist, of course, has done an update. Um, he did an article back a while ago called Wet Shaving Artisans Today, and, um, well, he's done an update on it. And, uh, you know, he says, he starts out, a few years ago I posted some thoughts on artisans who serve the shaving community, how they provide products that often are of exceptional quality at modest prices. Things have progressed over the years with the ranks of those using traditional tools, shaving brush and saving, shaving soap or cream for lather double-edged razor, single-edged razor, is growing rapidly. He goes on to say that uh, Reddit's Wicked Edge subreddit, for example, uh, didn't exist uh, not too long ago, and right now there's, well, over 73,000 subscribers. There was even an article in Forbes magazine talking about, well, wet shaving and the popularity of it. And I have, on this uh, podcast, talked about the growth in wet shaving. And it's really, you know, when you think about it, holy cow. And in fact, the other day I was watching uh, television. Um, I happened to watch, I don't know, some uh, some cheesy uh, 1970s kung fu Shaolin Temple Five Fingers of Death movie. I don't know which one it was. But I enjoy those. They're just kind of fun to watch. It's just, I don't know. I guess I'm weird that way. But anyhow, um, I was watching that, and there was this commercial coming on, and it was about razors. And this this company was selling a, a three-bladed German-made uh, cartridge razor that, uh, you know, the whole thing for that would allow you to shave for like a year was like 20 bucks and you know, they were saying that 20 bucks wouldn't even buy you but just a couple of replacement cartridges for Gillette. And, and you know, I got to thinking about that. I, I was looking at this this ad, and I'm thinking, my God, Gillette's getting just hammered. I believe it's high time that, uh, that Gillette come to the conclusion that, yeah, maybe they're asking a bit much for what they're doing because it's become very apparent, at least to me, that everybody on the planet understands that they're charging way, way, way too much for what you get. <laughs> and in fact, then, you know, when you throw in the fact that, okay, you know, you've got the, the multi-angle swivel uh, Dyson ball injected uh, Gillette razor, um, and now they're talking about, uh, you know, the, with the recent patents that they're going to have uh, shaving cream or lotion or balm or whatever the heck it is uh, squirting out of the handle, um, yeah, you know, how much gimmick can you get? And realistically, are you just doing something so that you can charge, you know, $20 for, you know, now it's like, okay, we charge $20 for the, uh, for the razor. 
now uh, we're going to charge $20 for the handle, too. <laughs> it is rather amazing, and it does make you wonder, you know, why is it that uh, that they have these things behind lock and key, you know? It's really just to make them seem like they're very expensive items and need to be protected, when in fact the actual item itself is, you know, pennies, uh, and uh, it's all just smoke and mirrors and hype and marketing. Yeah, I hate to say this, it's kind of like beer, you know, Budweiser. If uh, if you look at the, 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 there was a study that I looked at one time for Budweiser, I think it was, and the most expensive thing that is on the can is the advertising. Yeah. <laughs> when you look at Budweiser as a whole, they have more cost in advertising than they have in anything else. And in fact, you know, I think the next thing down was like the metal, you know, the aluminum can that the beer was in. And in fact, the, the least expensive thing of the whole operation was the actual beer that goes in the can. Yeah. <laughs> So you think about it, all these people are getting into the market. All these people are getting into, you know, Dollar Shave Club and Harry's Razor and, and this other company that I saw on the TV. And what it, what it you know, it, it dawns on you that people don't get into this stuff because they're not making money. They get into this stuff specifically for the reason that it will make money and that they are making money, which means that even at these, well, it, you know, low prices, uh, they're still making just killer profits. So if they're making killer profits, how much profit is Gillette making? Gillette is just, oh my gosh. <laughs> they are <clears throat> shaving dollar bills off of our wallet every single day and uh, laughing all the way to the bank, unfortunately. But uh, there you go. And uh, again, one of the things that is nice and that is, well, at least for me, a, a personal way to uh, fight back, if it, as it were, well, is to uh, use traditional methods. I get a sh better shave. I can support artisans. All in all, it's just, well, for me, uh, a victory. And it smells good every morning, too. So today's shave of the day. Today was a, a really nice shave of the day. I whipped out the deluxe shaving cream. Uh, uh, cool daddy-o again. Same stuff I used at camp. Um, well, just because. And a couple of things jumped out. First off, I had used Razor Rock, the, uh, the P160, the last couple of days, and uh, had gotten a little bit of irritation slash razor burn. I thought at first it was my razor, and so I changed blades in it. Turns out it wasn't necessarily my razor. It was in fact the, uh, the 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 P160, which is a similar experience to what I had well last time. So the P160 is going in a box marked "Do not use." <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'll just stick with the cello. Anyhow, the uh, the the shape of the day was uh, was the uh, cool daddyo, my Pleason brush, and. Uh, my Mercure Bakelite with a uh, with a Gillette Silver Blue in it, and it was a really really nice and comfortable shave. First off, I I went ahead and face lather, didn't bowl lather, just went ahead and face lather, and uh, of course when I face lather, I end up with an absolutely gorgeous uh, first time uh, uh, lather you know, real thick and everything else, and it was just really nice. Um, and then on subsequent lathers, I add a little bit of moisture and kind of loosen things up a bit, get more glide instead of cushion. So I finished it all up with some uh, balm, and uh, all in all, good stuff. So uh, great shave today, and uh, really helped. Felt good just pretty much all morning. Nice cooling effect from the uh, from the menthol. Very similar to what we experienced in camp. Which, uh, which of course, is a little bit different because, well, it's, you know, with the air conditioning and all, it wasn't quite as hot, but it was still very, very nice. So either it's just at the right level or, well, I'm getting used to it. All right, it is a beautiful, beautiful summer morning this morning. Rained last night, so everything's kind of fresh and glistening and in good shape and, well, all in all, life is good. Just got back from uh, vacation, so uh, great stuff there. Um, spent a week up at uh, summer camp with my uh, with my scouts, 
and uh, all is good. Lost one to homesickness. It happens, especially for the younger scouts. Sometimes they're not used to, uh, well, being outside, being away from home, being away from, you know, Nintendos and TVs and, you know, something to keep them constantly, uh, well, entertained. And, uh, you know, to a certain extent, uh, camp, uh, summer camp is filled with, uh, with merit badges and activities and, well, Sometimes there's a, I don't know, a level of maturity that needs to take place before that is thoroughly enjoyed. So, lost one to homesickness, but that's okay. All in all, they uh, they did a great job, and, well, I'm proud of them. Uh, just, it was, it was nice. Um, hot, muggy, holy cow. <laughs> in the 90s, high 90s, just about every day and usually somewhere in the 90% humidity range. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd take a, a, a shower, and by the time you got dressed, you were soaked again. <laughs> so it made for an interesting environment in which to do, well, anything. And uh, But it was all good stuff. I Like I said, for me, it is truly a vacation. Um I have a tendency to have a very active mind and and if I am focused on work or anything like that I can't well unfocus if you will. I can't you know for the for the normal day in and day out stuff it's very difficult for me to you know unhitch the wagon and uh, just just drop the focus on on stuff that is going on. I try. I attempt to because it is healthy to do that every now and then. But I found that for myself, um, one of the best ways to do that is to, uh, well, go to summer camp. Can't get cell phone reception worth a darn up there, and I have to focus on something that is, well, completely different, and that is making sure the scouts have a good time, and uh, once they get the ball rolling, then I can kind of kick back and, well, do whatever. In which case, for me and my uh, my assistant scoutmaster, it's uh, playing radio, playing ham radio specifically, and uh, we had a a good uh, a good time uh, over the week. the uh, The furthest contact that we made was Croatia, um, which uh, it was funny because one of the things that I have found about uh, announcing. Uh, uh, ham radio uh, stations or contacts that we've made to uh, to scouts, depending on their age, they understand. But it really flexes the old uh, uh, geography mind. Um, you know, when they when they come to the conclusion finally that uh, you know, okay, the first contact was in England. Oh my, that's across the ocean, and the second contact was Croatia. And half of them understand, and the other half go, yeah, but England's across the ocean. <laughs> so it's all good stuff, but it is uh, it is part of an education process, if you will, to uh, to expand the mind just a little bit. You know, we got a bunch of states, uh, got Puerto Rico, we got uh, North Dakota, Oregon, uh, Washington. Um, you know, all good stuff. Sometimes uh, difficult states to get. Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, and all of this was done essentially uh, the equivalent of a car battery, a radio, and a wire up in the trees, otherwise known as a dipole, but essentially a wire up in the trees. No infrastructure, just radio to radio, and uh, being able to explain that to scouts and and watch the marvel in their eyes especially when they get into the cell phone argument and and you tell them well you know with a cell phone you need infrastructure you need cell phone towers and your cell phone really can't well unless you have a walkie-talkie app uh and a wi-fi system you really can't go cell phone to cell phone um without the infrastructure your cell phone's essentially a brick Small one, but a brick nonetheless. Uh, whereas with radios, you can always do radio to radio, or you can go into uh, 
into nets, uh, you know, which is uh, a little bit different, has a little bit of infrastructure involved, but it was all good stuff. Got one boy through the uh, electricity merit badge, so uh, all good there. So uh, hopefully we have uh, we have uh, got some some kids interested in uh, in amateur radio. In fact, I, I know that the, uh, the the staff members, the counselors, uh, who are also all scouts, uh, were very interested in amateur radio and uh, came up to talk to us a few times, so that was good. And in fact, we even demonstrated and played around with slow scan TV. Uh, both me and my, uh, my uh, assistant scoutmaster have slow scan TV apps on our, uh, on our iPhones. And so we were walking around camp sending slow scan TV pictures back and forth on uh, on 2 meters and uh yeah just just very rudimentary uh but uh, it still got the point across. We were using uh little Baofeng radios and found out for example that uh if you hold the uh, the transmit button down for a given period of time after about 40 seconds it times out. <laughs> um so we ended up setting. I, I, there, there's a lot of potential uh, options for slow scan TV, and I never did go through them to find out which one would only take 40 seconds. But the black and white 36 second scan well fit the bill perfectly. <laughs> so we were sending, uh, sending and receiving black and white um, uh, 36 second pictures all over the place uh, on our iPhones and showing people, and well, just generally having a good time. So uh that was that was kind of it the uh the the vacation was was very refreshing got to sleep in my hammock every night I enjoy sleeping in my hammock it is so comfortable first off when it's hot and muggy you know uh, you just take off all the insulation and and you know you just have a uh just the hammock itself and it's almost like you have air conditioning on your back uh so that's pretty cool um, bug net is, uh, is integral to the, uh, to the hammock. So didn't have to worry about mosquitoes or anything like that. Um, the mosquitoes were down a little bit this year, although the, uh, the chiggers were out in force. <laughs> uh, how to be one with the, uh, with the animals, I guess. Um, we had, uh, we, we had more fun. We have a squirrel. I have multiple squirrels, but we talk about the squirrel. Um, a couple of years ago, we had this, this big brouhaha that we, uh, did in the troop where the, where the squirrel was the evil agent and, uh, the squirrel would come into our camp and, uh, and, uh, get into trouble. And, well, actually it was because the kids were leaving food out, but that's a different story. So, <laughs> so every year since then, you know, there, are, we, we would report, uh, sightings of the evil squirrel. The other thing that was fun with, uh, with amateur radio was that, uh, uh, not really amateur radio, but but radio is uh, we gave the kids radios, and uh, these are MERS radios, and uh, they would walk around camp and keep in contact with uh, with us up at camp and with each other, and it really was was actually almost pleasant. You know, it's uh, they would just check in and hey, where do I go next? And and where so and so? Has anybody seen anybody? Is anybody up at camp? You know, just, it was really neat. Now, of course, you know, there were other troops that were making fun of our scouts, but actually they were jealous because they didn't have the, the fun toy to play with. Um, so, uh, so that was, uh, that was rather interesting. And of course, we had several, uh, we programmed the radio so that there were several channels in which to choose from, but for the most part, they just stayed on one channel and just left it there. The other neat thing about it was that, uh, all of our troop could uh, could monitor the staff transmissions, and uh, they are public airwaves after all, and uh, the staff knew it. So as soon as we uh, rolled into camp, the uh, announcement went out on the uh, staff radios that the radio troop was, uh, was in town and to <clears throat> behave on the radio. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, so all in all, a fun time was had by all, very relaxing. Um, uh, it is Monday again, and uh, I understand that. Uh, part of me is glad it's Monday. Part of me wishes I was back at camp. <laughs> so it was, uh, well, probably the perfect vacation for me.
Well, that concludes this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you have some suggestions or would like a topic covered, drop me an email at brushandsoapandblade at gmail.com or give me a call at 864-372-6234 or contact us on Twitter at Brush and Blade. You can also visit us at our blog, brushandsoapandblade.wordpress.com. As always, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher. 